Thanks everyone for uh, turning up. Um, and thank you for obviously the millions of people who'll be watching this online. <laughs> um, so, um, my name is Johnny Miller. Um, I'm from a company called Axonops, and my talk is about our tool, Axonops, which gives you one-stop operations for Apache Cassandra. So, um, Axonops uh, is a, essentially a, a, a tool that allows you to uh, manage, monitor, and maintain your deployments of Apache Cassandra. And we, my, my background and uh, my team's background, we've been using Cassandra for many, many, many years. I started using Cassandra with 0 0.6 um, when it was like pretty, pretty bleeding edge. And um, I've pretty, we've pretty much had hands on most Cassandra weirdness in the world over the past decade. And we've seen the, the tools, the evolution of those tools uh, over time. But um, we wanted to do, we wanted, what we were finding was we were spending a lot of time uh, looking after the tooling to look after Cassandra, as opposed to looking after Cassandra. And there's some great tools out there, you know, I'm a big fan of Grafana, Prometheus, Rundeck, Elastic, all that good stuff. But what we were doing, finding is when we were deploying Cassandra into uh, environments, cloud or on-prem, we would be spending way more time doing the dance around getting the tools working, the tools deployed, the tools secure, the tool, the currency of those tools, than just looking at Cassandra. So it's basically hard enough getting Cassandra deployed into a, a restrictive environment. You come in, you say, I'm going to drop Cassandra in there, I'm going to drop half a dozen different agents, I'm going to open up a load of ports and start sending stuff around your network. You know, we work with you know, banks, insurance, governments, healthcare, the kind of places where they're really sensitive about what you drop on their servers. So we decided that we'd take a step back and we'd build a, a, a specific tool that gives you, in the strap line, one-stop operations for Apache Cassandra. And the, one of the call-outs there is we also developed this, uh, uh, our own bi-directional network protocol that allows us to communicate but both in the sense of collecting all the logs and metrics uh, off Cassandra, but also taking that information and acting on it on the, on the cluster as well. So we have one network, one socket, and that's all the logs, all the metrics, then all the control flags for doing things on your Cassandra cluster. So Axonops, um, if you want to have a little look, um, there is a website there, demo.axonops.cloud, which is a fully working, deployed uh, Axonops and a Cassandra cluster. You can click around and have, have a look at and I'll show you the demo um, as part of the, 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 the site. And you can see the, the, basically the features that we support. So we support Cassandra 3.11, 4.0, 4.1 and 5.0. So we have 5.0 beta 1 running. Um, I wouldn't suggest anybody puts it into production, but you can certainly, we, we're, we're kicking the tires uh, pretty heavily on Cassandra 5 and as soon as it goes to GA, we will literally be out the door uh, supporting it. And we've done a lot of work to take in the new features. We have specific um, dashboards and instrumentation about uh, the vector search and all that kind of new stuff in there as well. It also gives you uh, performance dashboards, um, which you'd expect, <laughs> um, a way of looking at all of your Cassandra logs. Um, and we have service checks, alerting notifications, backups, repairs, running restarts, reporting, basically everything you need to look after your Cassandra cluster. But why don't I show you <laughs> instead? So let me pop out uh, of the uh, presentation. So, so this is the uh, demo axonops.cloud uh, uh, cluster that I was telling you about. So when, when we look at the monitoring side of stuff, what we have, uh, when you come in, you see a, a whole bunch of dashboards that these become pre-configured and deployed for your Cassandra cluster. These are based on our experience, our recommendations about what you want to be looking at, what you want to be monitoring, what you want to be keeping an eye on. Um, but it's completely customizable. Yeah, you can go in, create your own dashboards, create your own uh, graphs. It's entirely within your control. And worth pointing out that the language we use to uh, define these dashboards is we have essentially a PromQL interpreter that uh, allows. So everybody's familiar with PromQL. So we figured why make something else. So we, uh, have, we support kind of PromQL type queries for producing dashboards or defining alerts and such across your metrics. Um, we also on the monitoring side have your, your logs um, as you would want. So all the logs uh, coming in around your Cassandra cluster. So, and then we have also 
service checks, and I'll go through each one of, one of these um, as, we, as we progress. So when you start looking at um, the monitoring side, one of the problems I had was the really uh, two things. The amount of data you want to see in a dashboard. Yeah? It, it, with, with Cassandra, there is an, an, an enormous amount of metrics that you need. And when you, the traditional tooling was essentially not really capable of keeping up with that, that the volume of metrics, both from, and, and what, what you end up doing, you'd end up reducing the metrics you were, you were taking off Cassandra. And the number of metrics really correlates to the usage, the number of key spaces, the number of tables. So as the, as the cluster starts getting more, more usage, you start to get more metrics. And you end up in this horrible cycle of blacklisting lots of metrics. And then when something goes wrong, you're like, I really don't know what went wrong because I didn't capture all these metrics. So, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So we support, we can capture tens of thousands of metrics off your uh, Cassandra node, and, uh, that, which, is, which is pretty cool, I have to say. Um, and we don't use JMX for this because what we also found was when you're capturing those uh, metrics through JMX, you actually hit the JVM quite hard and you actually interfere with what's, what you want your JVM to be doing, which is servicing your, the requests to your cluster. So we put a lot of work into really efficiently getting those metrics out of Cassandra. You don't notice it happening and the volume that we can take. And then the flip side of this was the, the other challenge we have is the precision of those metrics. So when you're looking at the other thing you typically end up doing is reducing the precision. So you say, oh, I'll take it by a minute, I'll take it by five minutes because you can't cope with the storage. So we support a five second granularity of the metrics. We can support even more, but we're kind of like, well, five seconds is probably okay. So when it comes to doing the kind of uh, inspection of what's happening on your cluster, you can really dig in to a really, really uh, fine point on, on what you're trying to look at. And that might sound, you know, about five seconds a minute, you know, what's, what's the issue? But when you've got like 300 servers and you have to search for something across a five minute window, of logs and metrics across 300 servers. That's a lot of stuff to be looking at. So the, fu the, the smaller that funnel I can get, the more precise I can get around whatever I'm looking at, it means I can find, it, find what's going on further. So we developed a graphing engine that's complementary to how we deal with metrics. So we're able to render thousands of data points, stream them through, and if you're doing this through something like, say, Grafana, I'm pretty sure everyone's experienced this. You have you're in three in the morning, you're dealing with an issue, and Grafana just starts dying because you can't cope with the number of metrics, the number of servers, etc. So we can render literally thousands of servers, thousands of tables, all in a dashboard, and you, you will not, you touch wood, he says, <laughs> you will not even see uh, those kind of problems. So that was a big deal for us. So when you look at the dashboards, um, all of these are um, defined through PromQL. So you would just literally create the prom uh, uh, query for this dashboard, it would get rendered with a, a, sele a select of choices. And the nice thing you can do is, as I said, you can really be zooming in onto the kind of levels you want. And at the same time as zooming in, we also zoom in on the, the associated logs with that time window. And of course, you can filter across whatever else you want to. So when it comes to looking at, okay, I had a spike, you know, what was, the, what was happening at that time in that spike, it's all there in one place. And you don't have to be popping out into a, Elastic dashboard or something else, and you're not copying. Okay, I've got this window here. I've got to go to this dashboard here and copy this window there. It's all in all in one place. Um, the other thing that we've got on the monitoring side is what we call um, service checks. Now, service checks are your kind of more uh, custom type of check you might want to run on your Cassandra node. So things like. I don't know, are my SSL certificates still valid? Has they, have they been revoked? Um, is this port listening? Uh, all those type of things. So what we give you there is the ability to create custom service checks with a bash-like syntax. It's not bash. We stop you doing things like RM minus RF and things like that, but you can essentially express um, any kind of check you want to happen on your service, and you can configure Axonauts to say, run this every minute, and what you do in your script, you give a non-zero exit code for your check, you get an alert triggered. So we have people using this to monitor other agents that this is running or this port is listening, et cetera. And the nice thing here is we also template out a lot of the things. So for example, if you wanted to write a service check that's 
check my Cassandra port is listening. You're not going to type port 9042. You can just put in a, a template. Same thing with the address. I'm listening on this address. So each node gets pushed. It gets templated into what is the configured values for that server. So that makes it very easy to produce these. And it's very rich. We have clients doing really complex type of checks um, through this. Um, then on the, 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 the maintenance side, um, there is a whole uh, raft of things you're going to want to be doing with uh, Cassandra. So we provide all of the necessary tools you expect to have from a maintenance perspective. So the first thing you've got, which everybody using Cassandra, um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a really interesting space <laughs> in Cassandra, is repairs. Okay? Now, if you know what repairs are, um, if you don't know what repairs are, repairs are a, a, an absolutely necessary operational uh, maintenance activity you have to run across your cluster on a regular basis. And it involves a lot of complex scheduling a, a lot, uh, and, and managing of that activity. And I've seen every flavor of where you would run repair over the, over the past decade. And we, we basically said, this is really uh, too complex. So we've developed a tool called Adaptive Repairs. And what Adaptive Repairs um, is doing is essentially you want to enable it, you toggle that switch, and that is it. You do not have to worry about repairs on your clusters anymore, okay? It is able to, you add new tables, you have different GC graces, whatever happens on your cluster, it automatically picks this up and repairs that data for you. But what it also does, which is the, the cool stuff, is if you run a repair, typically you kick that off and it's going to, you know, that horse that is out of the, 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 the stall, it is running. At the same time, you start, it, it's, it's competing with the resources on your cluster. It's using CPU, it's using IO, it's using network then all of a sudden it starts to interfere with the performance of your, your requests. And, oh, you know, what am I doing? Oh, I've got to kill the repair because my 99th percentile latencies have gone off click and et cetera. And then you're continuously going, oh, okay, now I'm going to turn it back on again, et cetera, et cetera. What we do with adaptive repair is because we have this fantastic pane of sight into what's happening on the cluster, we're looking at the performance and we're increasing or decreasing the intensity of the repairs based on what's happening on your cluster. So you don't need to go in and all of a sudden you have a big spike in requests coming in. Adaptive repairs will, st will slow down or stop yeah, until that goes away. And then you, it, once, once it has the headroom, comes back in, kicks up, speeds on, and keeping, keeps the repairs in place, which is very cool. But the even nicer part of this that you, you get is most, most clusters, you have a kind of a seasonal kind of workload. Yeah? You have periods of high load, periods of low load. But the cool thing with adaptive repairs is when, you're, when your cluster is idling, we take that. We will get ahead of the repair. We'll get ahead of that GC grace. So what that means is eventually, as, as the adaptive repairs run through their cycles, you're essentially beating the GC grace. You get your, and ultimately, your data ends up in a much more repaired state because it's naturally being repaired based on what's happening. So overall, you get a much more consistent uh, answer with your, with your, your data. But you all, and, and then we also have scheduled repairs for the kind of old school repairs that you, you do want to do on, under certain circumstances. Um, other thing on the kind of maintenance side is ro rolling restarts. <coughs> now you might think, a rolling, oh, what's wrong with a rolling restart? I can just uh, run it and away you go. But when you're looking after you know, 300 node Cassandra cluster and four DCs with multiple racks and multiple AZs, if you do one node at a time, you're going to be waiting a long time to get a rolling restart done. So what we have is the ability for you to create really complex restart strategies in, 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 in Axonops. So you can do things like restart more than w one node in each data center at the same time, or one node in each uh, rack in each data center at the same time, and really build it based on what you're doing, you can really get ahead of that rolling restart and be much more um, structured in the restart strategy you use. But the cool thing about it is, well, which I love because I hate this, is you often have a change window at like three in the morning. And what I can do is I can set up this rolling restart, I schedule it to run, I go to bed and the rolling restart happens. And then it also integrates with the alerting as well. So if when you can have it set up so that when the restart starts, you get a notification. When it finishes, you get a notification. Or if it fails, you get a notification. So you can basically schedule a rolling restart. If it fails, trigger a pager duty wake me up, come and do, do, what, do, do what needs to be done. And that's quite useful for my sleeping patterns. 
Um, and then on the, it wouldn't be much of a database management tool if we didn't support backups, okay? So with backups, um, you know, you wanna be backing up your cluster, yeah? It's one of the things I see in the field on a regular basis. People think just because Cassandra is highly resilient and I can have multiple kind of replicas of my data, et cetera, I don't need to back anything up. That is a fallacy, yeah? Even if you think you don't need to back up your, your data, you, need, you should be looking at backing up your system uh, data in your in your your nodes, and it's really important to to do this because it isn't necessarily about oh can I you know rebuild my node if I have a have something going wrong. It's your recovery time. It's how long does it take for you to get that node back online or that data center back online because something's gone wrong. So backups are really important. It's a database you should be backing up. But what we do with our backups is you have the, obviously the ability to schedule backups, uh, schedule the retention of those backups, but also take those backups off server, okay? So we support S3, SCP, uh, local mounts, whatever you like to copy those backups off server. And remember, this is all happening within your environment. We're not taking your backups and copying them into Axonops. This is all happening within your own infra, your own Amazon, your own Google. So you basically set up a backup in Cassandra, schedule it, runs, and away you go. But the, 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 the cool thing <laughs> about the backups is what we do around deduplication. So with traditionally, when you take a backup of Cassandra, you're doing what, what's called a no tool snapshot. And what that's doing is creating hard links to your SS tables. And every snapshot you take, you have another set of hard links to the file system. So what people, most people do is they take that snapshot and they copy that whole snapshot off server. What we do is we look at the deltas between each of the snapshots and we only take the changed SS tables off server. And the effect of that is the off server storage requirements reduce significantly because you're typically not churning through the data at that pace where you have a completely new set of SS tables every day. There's lots of stuff in there. So we maintain essentially that manifest of those SS tables off server. So when it comes to you, the, the cost of that storage, it comes down, and we've had people use us specifically for this. You know, you've got like a, <coughs> a large Cassandra cluster, you're backing up to S3, it's, even on S3, it will end up costing you a lot of money. So we solve that, that, that problem, and then as you'd expect with a backup, you wanna be doing restores as well, and we support doing restores uh, in there. Um, other thing to point out on the integration side is what do we support for triggering those notifications, triggering those alerts? So we pretty much support everything, yeah? And if there's something you want supported that's not there, let us know, we'll add it. So we, you know, we have emails, you've got PagerDuty, you've got Slack, Teams, Snow, OpsGenie, Webhook, whatever you like. And the nice thing about um, the way we set up notifications in Axonops is Obviously, you you'd have you have error as a, as an alert. You trigger an error alert. It goes to that whatever you've configured for the integration. But we also have the ability for you to override the global alerts with specific domain level alerts. So, as an example, backups. Maybe you have a backup team who needs to deal with backups failing. So, what you can do is you can trigger the error alert for backup to go to a completely separate um, PagerDuty, Slack, whatever you like, uh, for that specific team to handle. Yeah. And that's quite useful because we find in most enterprises there is a separation of concern um, on this or backup failing is not is a page of duty, but it's not a page of duty that's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. You'll look at it in nine at, n at nine in the morning when you come online. So there's often different requirements for what would be a wake me up, something's gone wrong or don't wake me up, I'll come, a, I'll come and look at it in the morning. And we split this up across global, the metrics, backups, those, the service checks I set for you individual node stuff, various commands, repairs, yeah? Do you want to be woken up at three in the morning if something fails on a repair? Maybe, maybe not. So you can deal with that. And that, that, that for me is a killer feature because often you end up with just kind of being blasted with noise on alerts. And the worst thing you can do with alerting is just start sending people alerts that they don't care about. Because what happens <laughs> is when you get an alert you should care about, you ignore it, yeah? So I'm a big fan of being very, very targeted with when you uh, wake someone up, when you send that error alert and where you send it to. And this gives us that way of going, okay, hold on, you, okay, backup alert goes to Slack. Node down goes to PagerDuty, yeah? You can configure that all up. And the other thing that you can also do is you can set up personal 
um, uh, integrations for metrics as well. So you can go into the, a dashboard and say, I'm personally looking at, say, this, this metric, this table. If this happens, send me a message on Slack or whatever specific to me. So you have your own stuff you might want to look at, team level stuff, domain level stuff, all in, all in the one place. So, um, so, so essentially, um, that's Axonauts, uh, you know, pretty much in a nutshell. So we have performance dashboards, uh, which I've shown you there. We've got the logs, you've got service checks, which are, I, I do quite like. It's because every environment's different. Yeah? There's often weird little things that you need to check for. We, the alerting and the notification, there's no, you can, anything you want to alert on, anywhere you want to send it, it'll support it. We give you backups um, and we have adaptive repairs. Don't underestimate adaptive repairs. It's like, n I would say, 60% of everybody, every guy looking after or girl looking after Cassandra's time is spent dealing with repairs and turning them on, and turning them off, and recovering and restarting. And, and oh, one thing to make sure you know on adaptive repairs is when it stops, yeah, it resumes from where it last was. Okay, so if you go in and say turn off adaptive repairs. It will basically remember the state it had got to, the point it had got to with the range of the repair. So when you start it again, it just resumes from there, as opposed to, I've killed my repair after being 90% through it, and now I've got to start again and go all the way through. So it's very good at checkpointing where it's got to in the repairs. Uh, rolling restarts, which you will definitely need. And oh, I didn't actually show you um, the, re the reporting. So we also have this um, ability to create um, reports and what essentially we do is uh, where's it gone? I don't know, I'll, sh I'll show it to you another time. <laughs> so we essentially what we can do with reports is we'll generate a PDF report based on a dashboard you pointed at. So you can what we use this for is essentially you'll have say you've different teams who might want to be looking at a particular set of metrics or key spaces or tables, and we can set up Axnops to generate you a report on the PDFs. And, and you can then distribute that to your manager, to your team, to say this is the performance of your, your whatever you care about, these are the incidents that have happened upon this cluster, and that all gets generated into a PDF to send across to your team. So, um, so there's one more thing. <laughs> and I forgot my turtleneck, but uh, uh, we, we, uh, we're, one of the things that we're really, really happy to announce uh, today is we're essentially launching a technical preview of Apache Cassandra cloud provisioning through Axonops. And what this is doing, it is enabling the provisionance and maintenance of a production-ready Cassandra cluster directly into your own AWS account, your own VPC. And basically what you do is you go into the SaaS, you provide it with the necessary credentials for your cloud account, and you can then go in, click a button, press deploy, and it will go in and deploy a production-grade, secure uh, Apache Cassandra cluster directly under your own control, your own VPC, your own EC2 instances, your own compute instances, yeah? Not on someone else's servers, not on, so, so you, you maintain the control of that data, but you get exactly a, a, as good a quality level of service, but it's all running on your own instances, so you benefit from those cloud discounts based on it running on your stuff. You have the complete control of around the access to that data, when they can access, who can access it, etc. You don't have to worry about any of those. Often the challenges is all your PCI, your PII kind of requirements around, I can't put this data out onto a shared service. Um, it supports um, automated scaling, upgrades, and uh, everything you want to do to look after your Cassandra cluster. So. Um, Here's, an, ex here's a, uh, an example of going in and provisioning a new cluster in AWS. So you go in, you select where you want to go to, you provide, we give you the, set, the, the necessary things to set up from an IAM perspective, you make sure you've got your everything set up, you confirm you've got everything you want to do, you go in, you pick your access key you're going to use, you pick the region you're going to deploy to, you pick the VPC you want to deploy under, you choose the subnets and AZs you want to be placed under, and then you click next, and then here you pick the number of nodes you want to deploy, nice little sliding bar to let you do this. And um, you, yeah, 64 would be a good thing, but you know, we, we'll, we'll go with, I think, probably six for this one. Then the next thing you do is you choose the type of EC2 instance you want to deploy onto. You pick ephemeral or persistent. 
We also give you the, the cost as well when you're doing this, the cost of a storage, the cost of the EC2 instance, and then you pick what kind of instance type you want to deploy onto. And here we're going to pick a, a whatever. Um, and then the next thing you do is you give it a name. And you obviously need a, a Bastion key as well for allow you to connect up and do stuff. You pick the version of Cassandra you want to deploy. You click Next. Out of the box, we'd like you to set up a backup. You configure that backup. It, it, will, it will create that S3 bucket if it isn't already there. You can give it one. Give you a summary of what they're going to do. You click Create. And obviously, this is sped up because it takes a little bit longer to start up the instances. But then you go in and, hey, presto, there is your deployed Apache Cassandra cluster with three nodes, and we set this all up, all of the SSL, we, the key stores, the trust stores, the super new, we provision with authentication on, we create, we remove the default super user, we, ge we generate a random password. It is now ready as good as you would need in a, like, this, would be work, we, this would be appropriate for a, a financial institution, anything, the OS, everything. Next thing you get there is, which is, this is quite handy, it's scaling up a, a cluster. So what we want to do here is increase the number of nodes in our cluster. It's as simple as that. You just literally toggle it up, pick the amount of nodes you want to add, um, click scale, click the button, scale, and then bam, that is it. It now goes in and adds the necessary nodes to your Cassandra cluster, scales it up, and you can now have six nodes instead of three. Um, and then the other thing um, we do is uh, upgrading of Cassandra as well. So simply put, uh, here we're going to do we're going to do an upgrade from 4.1.1 to 4.1.3. You literally go in, pick the version you want to up upgrade to, click update, and hey presto! Through the magic of speeding up the video, your cluster is now upgraded to 4.1.3. When we look at those details now, it's all been uh, upgraded for you. Uh, in, 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 in there. And then there's another fa fa favorite of mine, um, which is the uh, SSL certificates. <laughs> you know, no one likes uh, managing certificates, particularly not in Cassandra. And here we make this really easy for you to essentially go in and refresh your SSL certificates uh, and literally go in, quick refresh, boom, uh, away you go. It's now refreshed all the SSL certificates across your Cassandra cluster. So um, what I've shown you there is through the cloud provisioning tool, the ability for you to provision a cluster uh, into right now AWS. We've got Azure, Google, other things coming down the pipeline. Scale that up and down um, as you need and perform an upgrade of Cassandra. And there's plenty more as well in there. We support replacing nodes, changing instance types, OS patching as well. So we will let you, you probably didn't, you saw the button to patch the OS. We do all that for you as well. When you want to upgrade or patch the OS based on the security, you click Patch OS. It goes in, patches the OS with everything you need. And this is pretty cool. <laughs> um, and we're really, really uh, excited to do it. So basically, I know I, I, I'll say this because it's, I, I work for the company. It, Axnops is, is the only solution for one-stop operations for Apache Cassandra. It gives you everything you need to do to monitor that cluster, maintain that cluster, back up that cluster, and now, the, now provisioning as well. And the, the, the power here is that you can now very easily, at the click of a couple of buttons, deploy, like this is the same level of security, of resilience that we do on lots of clients, clusters into your own cloud account, under your, on your own instances, on your own VPC, all under your control without having to spend ages figuring out how to do this, how to all write all the automation, anything around that. And then we also give you all of the necessary tooling to monitor that out of the box. It has all of the dashboards configured for you, the backups for, that you need to do, repairs, your logs, etc. And we're continuously updating it and adding more and more new features. And, um, you know, it works. <laughs> and the other thing to also point out on the provisioning side, this isn't just executing a bunch of Ansible or Chef. Yeah, this is a this is this is this is you know this is stateful. Yeah, you need to be able to running these things in really a stateful kind of flow and process flow around this. So it isn't just we don't just randomly go upgrade. <laughs> we are we are checking things as part of the upgrade. We're going ooh something's gone wrong. Roll back the upgrade. We have specific flows for say you're coming from. Uh, a, ma a minor, a, a new major version of an upgrade, we will have the specific steps to support that upgrade. So 
possibly you need to rewrite all the SS tables as part of this upgrade or whatever, that'll be part of that specific flow for that upgrade path for you. And our job is to put that all, all that smarts into the tool so you can just basically go there, click buttons, and not have to worry uh, about it and just focus on Cassandra. So uh, thank you very much. Um, we've got time for questions, but just to point out, um, there's a couple of cool things that you can already go and have a play with. We have our, as I'd said, we have that demo uh, environment. You can go and click around and have a look. Um, we also have this Axonops starter program, which is free, basically up for, up for six nodes, cloud or self-hosted, off you go, use Axonops get your Cassandra w working. And also, if you, if you sign up now for the, the we're obviously we're, we're getting, a, actually getting quite a bit of demand for the provisioning, so we're operating a, really a technical preview mode. So if, you, if you're interested, scan that QWERTY code, register your interest, and then we'll let you know, and you can come in and start uh, playing with the provisioning your, yourself. And if you, do if you do register now, we also give you a free upgrade to Axonops Enterprise, to, uh, which gives you some additional features to what you'd be getting on the, the free program as well. So, that, any questions? Well, actually, typically the SS tables are already compressed. So when you when you create your 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 table in Cassandra, you have they, they, they're all, by default they're compressed with LZ4. So you, yes, you could compress them, but you're not going to get like a, a massive drop in uh, volume based on the compression. And then on the, uh, on the provisioning part, can you uh, export certificates uh, for, for clients? Yeah, absolutely. So once, once you've provisioned it, you've got to take those, the, those certificates and provide them to your applications to use. So yeah, you, you, once it's created that cluster, you can download the JKS and use what you want to do. And you can also copy the CA out to use for yourself to issue certificates. So there, our thoughts there are you might take that copy of that CA certificate, bring that into your own certificate provisioning environment that maybe you're using that to distribute those certs. So like imagine Vault or something like that to generate those certs, push them to your apps as you need them. So you can download the JKS, you can take the, the CA yourself, drop it in and, and use it. Anything else? Stunned silence. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, so give it a go. Uh, try it out. If you have any questions, you can. There's my email address, uh, Johnny at axonops.com, or you can send an email to community at axonops.com, and do sign up for the technical preview for the provisioning and uh, get on, get on the list. And we'll also give you that free upgrade to uh, Axonox Enterprise. So, if there's no other questions. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time. I hope you liked it. And uh, enjoy the rest of uh, the summit.